okay. I was like, well, I broke it. Um... All right, welcome back to Girls Talk Comics. This is Erin, your master of mediocrity, here with the lovely, the wonderful, the super charismatic. I don't know of anybody who's charismatic on this podcast other than you, but Erin, it's me, Lieutenant Literature, oh. Jessica. <laughs> well, I was talking about you, so I'm glad you finally introduced yourself. Jeez. Anticipation. Anticipation. So today we're going to be talking about Bitter Root. Bitter Root, Image Comics, with three creators, David Walker, Chuck Brown, and Sanford Green. Now, Jessica, did you want me to talk about the comic today, introduce it, or did you have a little spiel for us today? I don't have a little spiel, but I can read you the back matter, because I think they do a pretty good job on the back matter. Image does, usually. They do have a really great sales pitch team. So yeah, go ahead. Well, so can you just give me their last name real quick? Sangeries? Sangere. Sangere? Okay. Once the Sangere were known as the greatest monster hunting family of all time. Their specialty? Curing the souls of those infected by hate. Now those days are fading. A terrible tragedy has claimed most of the family, and the remaining cousins find themselves divided by their methods. But with a new breed of monster loose on the streets of Harlem, the Sangre family will have to come together to stop it or watch the human race fall to untold evil. And some of the other things that they've included in the image back matter have sort of illuminated that this is during the Harlem Re- Renaissance, but it's sort of like a gothopunk, gothofunk style of story where it kind of takes an aspect Afrofuturistic look at the Harlem Renaissance, kind of combining some of the native African and spiritual roots of their medicinal herb making and lore into a sort of futuristic science kind of delivery, which is always fun, kind of in the same vein as steampunk, but uh, very much more Mm -hmm. centered around, you know, African histories. Which is like, I always enjoy this sort of like mediocre's stuff because all of the details feel so much richer because they're new to me. They're not new, but they're new to me. And it's a, it's nice to be exposed to more backgrounds and histories, sort of for the same reason that I enjoy like Japanese and Korean properties. So yeah, this was an interesting, this was an interesting title that you sort of brought to me. Why did you suggest this? So when I first heard about this, I was incredibly excited. Um, The idea of Harlem Renaissance, Black Monster Hunters, just everything about it was really, really great because this book focuses a lot on racism and race massacres and racial issues that were happening during the 1920s. The family that we have, or the monsters that they're fighting at least, monsters are called Jinu. Jinu? Um, pronunciation is a little bit kind of hard for us to find, but it's or it's spelled J-I-N-O-O. These demons are are white people who have been so overwhelmed by the hate and the anger that one experiences when racist uh, that it's transformed them into something non-human. And what's also happening in the family are these the divides that you alluded to are kind of do we purify them using our spiritual knowledge and our knowledge about roots and med- and medicine or do we just kill them, take them out? Send them back to hell where they're from through those methods. Yeah. So they're really, it's a really kind of interesting dialogue for the family. What I also thought was great is that uh, the new monster that they're dealing with is kind of a spoiler, are survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. And that, that really kind of hit with me a little bit because I grew up in that area and had been fortunate enough in my public schooling to actually hear about the race massacre. And that actually wasn't something that was talked a lot about in public schools. And still, as of today in Oklahoma, that's still a uh, topic of contention. They recently, in just a few the past few years, even started investigating where mass graves are, uh, talking about restitution. 
and it certainly kind of came to a peak with certain presidential campaigning right around the anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. It's 100th anniversary is coming up quite soon. So it uh, it was just really intriguing from the start. And I I also really made it a goal when I was working in the stores to recommend material that was about non-white stories done by non-white teams, creator teams. And so this one, when this one came out, was definitely one I try- I recommended to customers to try to get them to interact with and continue to read and engage with. Because I work in stores and I didn't have a lot of non-white coworkers. So it kind of became me, like my goal and the per- my coworkers' goals to us having to advocate for those smaller stories that, uh, we're not going to feature a lot of white characters or white creative teams. And it was just my way of trying to fight the racism in the comic industry. But <laughs> so this this story kind of my relationship with it is a little multifaceted. Uh, the end all be all is just the entire conversation about how the devils are just very angry, hateful white people. The anger and rage that can come from experiencing the trauma of racism, certainly when it's a race massacre, and just the complexity of how do you solve this problem. Being a white person reading it, it, I don't know, it kind of made it interesting in the sense of (laughs) how do I prevent that hatred and that sense of villainy from infecting those around me um, so they don't become something just completely non-human when rage and hatred. Mm-hmm. But I think res- the conversation about resolving it by black monster hunters is one that is unfortunate. I think it reflects a little bit about responsibility on non-white people and racism conversations. And yeah. it's just maybe not one that I'm fully uh, educated in. But it's like, yeah. So again, relationship with this is multifaceted. So Well, and they give us they give us as outside readers, you know, people who are outside of the community that's trying to struggle with this and is forced to struggle with this and be sort of their own advocate and also the person who helps other people navigate it, you know, because there's always those stories about, you know, like African Americans being the people who have to sort of represent themselves and their entire quote unquote race, you know, like their entire community of people. And a lot of the essays in the back matter of these sort of dealt with, you know, like how it seems to be an artificial structure that they're now held to account for. Um, But they do give us as white readers a vehicle for approaching this through this kid that... um, Content warning for people who are listening. um, Please skip over the next period of time if you don't want to hear it. He was at a lynching. It was one, spoiler for people who are listening, it was one that was effectively prevented. Yes. By Ford, one of the men in the family named Ford, he prevented the lynching. But yes, Johnny Ray Knox is the white kid who ends up tagging along with Ford and fighting with Ford, which again is a nice vehicle for us to kind of come in. But he, he, I think from his explanation for himself at two, when he is confronted with the cousin, because the cousin that he's confronted with is the one who wants to quote amputate. He is not interested in, in purifying. He's he's the cousin mm-hmm. that's interested in in once you've crossed you're you're done and he effectively puts down everybody except for Johnny and Johnny didn't realize according to him that this was going to be a lynching he thought it was I think probably just a meeting of his pals um, is sort of how he's presenting his his case and to his credit he just sort of follows along with the monster hunter he's like well uh, looks like you're the guy that I need to that I need to stick close to. And so you see him sort of being this helpful hand around the house and stuff later, which I think is nice because it gives a sort of an open door for allyship in people who aren't part of the community. But also mm-hmm. it's definitely not a main role. You know, his yeah. his first action is to sort of be like, I think I know where more are, you know, and, and kind of leads him to this ultra demon from the other side that didn't seem to be originally human, but was like, sort of the face for just the The most racist of 
Yeah, the most yeah. racist of Southern white men that the really old, mm-hmm. like 80s, 90 year old people who have no apologetic bone in their body for it, you know, don't Not even have a lens to think yeah. that it's wrong. Johnny, it it is commendable that he, his first role is to, again, identify others, but he then, like, in his experience with Ford, he j- is just kind of like, yeah, this is fucked up. <laughs> I don't want to be part of it. And I do appreciate that they didn't really give him, like, a voice. They didn't give him a starring role in the show. They he yeah. just came along to con- also continue to fight against the this evil and save others and do what he can to participate without taking over the show and it does it does help that David that Mr. Walker, Mr. Brown and Mr. Green are all black men and so they mm-hmm. like their control and their focus on this conversation they they intentionally doing that I think is really good. It's just good. It's just good. All of it's good. Um No. <laughs> Agreed. And they keep showing him throughout the series, but yeah, that first scene where he he furthers the plot. He's like a plot device. He's like, here's this bigger, batter mm-hmm. thing, which triggers the I'm gonna go back to Harlem to see my family and the sort of like deal mm-hmm. like the way that they get the whole family back together again. He's useful in that way, but yeah, he doesn't take over any of the limelight and that's really nice. Like you you see him and it's uncomfortable because basically what they're like what they're doing as their vehicle for white readers is completely complicit in, but also like trying to make amends for. And then later they give him like abilities in subservient roles, like holding soup pots and being of service. But yeah, don't, don't take any of the action or agency away from the families who have been doing the heavy lifting the entire time. And right. I they really, didn't make him a white really, savior, which is really good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they also didn't villainize him in that way either. Like, I, I thought that was really nice. Right. There was no, like, yeah. Because I, I think that I was very I was very interested in hearing the voices of the non-white creators in this. Because you hear several. Like, there's just not, there's not one voice. Like, it's, like, a lot of these essays in the back are like, mm-hmm. you know. It's unreasonable for one person to be the voice for everyone of, you know, their their community, their racial community. And mm-hmm. oh, my God, those essays in the back were so good. Oh, oh my God, they were. They were so good. And they contextualized yeah. it so well. And I think that was part a part mm-hmm. of what my struggle was is I first of all, I was reading this digital copy. So it's very small on my phone. So I got lost in the action a couple of different times. Not that the art wasn't amazing. It was just very stylistic and very busy in a lot of places especially with the monsters uh sort of coming like there was like a monster fight that was just massive and it was really hard to follow on my little bitty phone but also then i'm reading these really wonderful essays not after each issue like they were originally published but just kind of all packed at the end and i kind of wish i would have been able to read the essays as i went through each individual issue because i think it would have really informed that issue when i was reading it so right I think those ish- those essays really helped sort of contextualize and really help me get access to a lot of the points they were trying to make in in these com- comics and sort of it's an interesting thing because I was very uncomfortable with the 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 monsters within their community that they were talking about like this is so definitely if if this is so delicate to me you know because they're talking about the monsters that can be created within their own community, you know, through the pain and the fear and, you know, kind of calling attention to the problems that arise from that as well. And it makes me very uncomfortable mm-hmm. for the line that this community has to really tow. And I think that's the point of the book. Yeah, because you don't want to villainize the victim, but at the same time, like, you're you're watching mm-hmm. that, you know, like, having gone through trauma, you sometimes are, you know, changed in ways that are not necessarily for the better and it's just oof, it's really it's a it's a very dense comic it's got a lot yeah yeah it's not a uh i think i want people to read this for just kind of the emotional journey that like i think you and i both went on in reading this book and i want people to read it because the articles that are at the end of the book and i want people to read it knowing that it's a conversation and an experience that none of us have none of us will have and it's not really one 
like th- this is us, I think, kind of talking about our our understanding and our reactions to it. But it's not one that I think we can really. I, long story short, I'm really glad I have this vehicle in which to get people to kind of engage with how racism is still impacting today. You know, like it, it's it's so. I mm-hmm. and I don't know if. Mr. Walker, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Green made this with the idea that it's supposed to, it's going to be used as a, as an empathy tool, <laughs> like of me going out and being like, "Hey, if you want an action comic and you a sci fi comic and you also want a a lens into racism in the 1920s and how it can still echo for today and feel similar to today, read Bitterroot." But it's definitely a tool, not the tool, because there are a lot of other tools out mm-hmm, there. But it's mm-hmm. definitely an option. Well, I will say that I like how. It is also, it's not just, I mean, like, it's not just about us, right? Like, it's an empathy tool, right? We can use it as an empathy tool, but it's also just a celebration of a sort of more Afrocentric art, you know, like Harlem Renaissance style. This is the art that we as a community have built for ourselves. And the visual identifiers and clues that are specifically ours and cultural heritage that we can use to tell a modern story in this fun new way. That is, that is, I think, more what they're, <laughs> the creators are focused on. And it just is because it is a story that everybody in their community has to deal with in some ways. Like, that is just sort of a byproduct is that we can use it as an empathy tool it's kind of like whatever i'm watching like asian tv shows and stuff like they're not trying to explain to me what their visual comedy history is whatever they're making they're just using their their tools that they have at their disposal and that their community is built for themselves like themselves but but i as an anthropological style of of watcher i'm trying to sort of infer what i can about how they've built this art for themselves and how their tv is different from our tv and in some ways that's kind of another thing i was doing here like part of it was i was trying to parse through what was the like traditional superhero like style of art but then also trying to identify what was specific to their community that they were focusing on and then also trying to sort of look at how their future tech and their, you know, like portrayals of different archetypes and their, you know, they have, because a lot of the essays talk about archetypes in their community and Mm -hmm. sort of just identifying what their archetypes are that I'm not necessarily exposed to, or I'm exposed to solely in problematic ways. (sighs) It's just a lot. I mean, like I I definitely completely out of my depth, whatever it comes to sort of trying to, to, this is just, is all very on the surface that is what I'm able to access. But you see in the ends of these issues, these very highly educated, intelligent people who have a lot more tools to talk about this content than I do, who are within the community, and they do a very good job of helping you access some of the other stuff that maybe aren't there immediately for you. Because I'm one of the people right. who went to public schools who didn't know about the Tulsa race riots. And there was one essay in particular yeah. that kind of talks about how it was this thriving black community that you know yep. kind of proved that outside of the the turmoil and hatred and and derision the communities are completely capable of creating their own stories and culture and history and yep. do it in a happy healthy way so yeah that's something that really impactful when you're reading it and that was a lot of why i was excited and why i recommend it to others is because it's just it's just so much. It's just so much. And I don't know. I'm very excited that it exists. And I'm very glad it was being published. And I think it's still ongoing. But would you like to hear a little bit about the creators? I absolutely would. Okay. So again, there are three creators, David Walker, Chuck Brown, and Sanford Green. And I, I've got a little bit of information about each of them so david walker he has done a lot of comic work he was even a writer for naomi which is another great comic that people should read he worked on shaft luke cage power man and iron fist nighthawk fury secret wars battle world um he also worked on cyborg number 13 and all a lot of different titles across dc and marvel he actually has a really great website that talks a lot about 
what he's done and what he's doing, and you can just find it by searching his name. Uh, he is a leading scholar of black exploitation films, and I believe is still an adjunct professor. He's done a lot of education work and a lot of teaching about documentary filmmaking and getting into comics writing. So he is very active in kind of an educational setting as well in a comic setting. And I think that is a power that uh, should not be crossed. I mean, like he has two superpowers, teaching and comic writing, and he is a man you should not cross. Like that's a terrifying amount of skill condensed into one person and kudos to him for working very, very hard to get there. Um, Chuck Brown, also a writer. He has written for The Punisher and Black Panther. He is a co-creator and writer for Rotten Apple, and he does a lot of self-publishing work. He has written for Z Xenoscope Entertainment, 12 Gauge Comics, and Webtoon, line Webtoon, where you and I have read many comics from. I found his comics on Webtoon, and they're short series, um, only going to about the time he started working on Bitterroot, which, you know, good for him, because Bitterroot probably pays him more than being on webtoon does. Yeah. Uh, he's also working on a series called On the Stump, which I just found today for the recording. And the first issue is free to read online. I think On the Stump is, uh, I want to say, gosh, I'd have to find it again. I think it's, it might be Image. It's something I definitely want to look into more, and it was also something I had to stop looking into because we had to record. So mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I was about to read that and then just miss our, you know, our recording session, and that wouldn't have been a good look. Um, Sanford Green yeah. is our artist, and his art is fucking amazing. I love what he did with Bitterroot and the fact that when you had multiple voices in stories, he well, he and the colorist, I don't. Actually, I didn't write that name down. Whoops. But whatever working they did to give them each storyline a different color and the way they set up the frames and the, the scenes was just, it made it reading for me a little bit easier and it made it a little easier to follow the storylines and the different events that were happening all at the same time. And I just, I love his bold expression work. Oh, there's so much about it. I was like, this is fucking amazing anyway he's been working in comics for over 15 years he like every artist and writers worked for marvel dc dark horse and image he also did power man and iron fist black panther and luke cage and he works on the webtoon comics with chuck brown he's the artist for them uh his style is just so dynamic and i um really i just love it it's it's just really bold work and i love bold work because i really appreciate people's willingness to draw facial expressions on characters i think it's important to draw facial exp expressions i think it's important to draw a uh, really emotional body language and i just looking through his art i'm like he has no concerns about making sure people look scared or happy or angry and he draws you know monsters really well too so he just he just he did a really good job for drawing a super natural action comic. Yeah, and I just looked it up. Volume 2, the collected edition of Volume 2, is actually scheduled to release October 21st this year, 2020. So it is still ongoing, thankfully. Ooh. Uh, it looks like issue number 10 released September 2nd. So it seems to be about a monthly release schedule. And it gives you mm -hmm. enough time to read the first volume and then not have to wait forever to read the second one uh though it does look like there was yeah. some slowdown maybe or maybe that's just the way that i'm yeah okay so it, it started releasing there, in 2018. there definitely was a long gap yeah so but it look it looks like it's picked back up again and hopefully that all of that scheduling stays on task i have been really hopeful that at least maybe the comic creation doesn't get thrown off by our current uh situation in the world because uh, yeah. hopefully that's like a solo work thing maybe the print's not there but maybe you can buy the digital copy though i will say if you want to watch this read this uh digital copy I, i'm not saying the digital copy is wrong if that's how you buy your comics i know there's a lot of places in the world that don't have good access to comic book shops but uh maybe do a tablet or laptop for this because this phone <laughs> does not give you 
a lot of space to sort of track the action and it has essays like no no screw around actual like people who work in university essays essays. yeah Yeah, um Mm -hmm. and and if you've been reading fan fiction for a year straight and all of a sudden have to switch to reading (laughs) educated (laughs) essays uh Maybe it would be a, a lot bit of a jump <laughs> for one afternoon. Yeah, for one afternoon. But um, this is just a really, it's its hard to comment too much on, right? Because it's its not really for us, but it is something right. that I'm glad that I've read. Um, mm-hmm. I, I will say that any time, there's this movie that comes to mind. I just saw it on Amazon Prime, which is part of the reason why it comes to mind. Four Colored Girls. Do you have, did you ever watch that movie, Erin? I haven't. Uh, it was a big experience for me because it, I mean, like, I watched it in college, and there's a lot of just female things, but female things are multiplied with uh, race things when it comes to trans feminism so it's not like just a plus sign it's more like a multiplication sign there was some conversation about a woman's place with the character um the there was a young woman character in this with a very short name what was her name um, it almost felt like a noun the 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 female character it's not ma etna it's blink the female character blink which is a noun but also a name <laughs> There was a conversation about her place in the fight uh, centered around the character Blake that mm-hmm. felt very, very basic. But from watching sort of Four Colored Girls, I know that sometimes the conversations within more ethnic communities are maybe not as nuanced or as progressive in some ways, like like they're struggling against much more than just what a white feminist is struggling against. You know, like uh, yes. as a as a white woman, I have a lot less cultural shit stacked up against me. I'm not dealing with my ethno community specific stuff in the same sort of extremeness as mm-hmm. like a Latina might be or a black woman might be. Um, the conversations are very much more. They're very much Simple. more complicated by, yeah. S- simpler oh, in some yeah. ways, Sim- but Simple also for complicated us. in other ways. It feels very Simple much like, us, well, of course definitely. that's not okay. Like, that's not absolutely not your place to tell me where, you know. But, you know, with the religiosity of some communities, it becomes much more like a woman's place is in the home and stuff. And, and I'm basically benefiting from the fact that I didn't have a religious upbringing in that way. So I don't have to, like, fight against a you know biblical style of home (laughs) you know like so so it's hard to comment on you know black feminism or like saying hey yeah they they did a good job but but they're still black men talking about a woman you know but i don't know like so I, i i was watching that specifically thinking huh i wonder how this reads to the women in the community you know in the end like you know no spoilers intended but ma etna says i'm glad that you didn't listen to me you know and you still pursued fighting abilities and stuff because that was the fight was you should be in here mixing the root potions instead of out there fighting that's the man's place to go out fighting Mm -hmm. the monsters and your place is to make the root potion Mm -hmm. and and blink didn't want any of that she she was very much like i'm better at fighting than boys are you know like i'm gonna do it and so it was very basic it was a very like but they dedicated so much time to it. I couldn't help but look at that specifically and going and you know think to myself, how does this feel as a woman in that community? Does it feel like they're doing me a disservice in this, or does it feel like like oh, okay, so you know that was a good outcome, but it was very it wasn't super nuanced. It was very black and white, or you know like it makes me yeah. interested. And I wish one of the essays at the end came from that, but you know they were focused much more on the over the the overall theme yeah. of fighting the monster yeah. of racism, which is understandable for sure. But like yeah. anytime they yeah. they do that, I'm very interested in hearing the, you know, black female perspective 
Because Mm -hmm. when I have seen it, like in the movie Four Crawler Girls, it was very impactful for me, even just as a woman, to see them fighting and struggling and surviving in their community against all of the hardships. And I am very much interested in that in comics, but I know that it it is hard whenever you're, especially like you're saying, whenever you're trying to highlight stories written by non-white creators about non-white conversations, there's not a lot of them out there. Like, there's more now than there ever have been, but it's still, it's a small pull. So, yep. that's my, that's yeah. my want in the world is to have a more, you know, female voice comic f- for me to engage with, because I think it really informs my feminism whenever I hear those stories from other women with different backgrounds than I do. Yeah. And and I'm always very interested to listen specifically to those because I think there's a vehicle for me to engage with their trauma, with my own trauma, and then also a way for me to understand how different those traumas are, you know, and be more empathetic Mm -hmm. as a person and, you know, more trained and more inclusive. That's all we could want for any of us, right? Right, yeah. But being able to see a little bit of similarities is a lot does a lot of the work for you whenever you're trying to understand what the differences are. And I think that's why, you know, black feminism is easier for me to engage with than just overall about black stories. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm also like, I live in a rural yeah. area, so yeah. I don't have an urban story that I can connect to. So all I have are just the overall, I don't know what it looks right, like, yeah. like to live in New York city versus I live in the country in a farm, so like I, I can't connect to that aspect <laughs> of it when it's just an overall like yeah. urban story. But I can totally connect to the femaleness whenever it's a black feminist voice. So right. I don't know. That, right. That's just that's one thing that I saw and immediately honed in on. And I, I don't think they did a bad job, you know, like just from my uninformed viewpoint. But it was definitely something I was curious about. Like, hmm, was that good? Just like, I uh, we had a. What are you reading where we were talking about bromance? Um, so you should go listen to that, people. Nobody's listening to those. You should go listen to that. Um, but we we were confused up front because we were like, mm, is this is this like it a very well done story for this culture? Or is this like, ugh, like making fun of the games, yeah, like, quote unquote. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, we don't know. How progressive we will never is know. We, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. But definitely, that's how I feel about a lot of media. Where I'm like, that's not from a perspective I understand. I'm like, is this is this progressive? I don't know. Like, <laughs> it. Yeah. Um. It's hard because you you want to expand your horizons and you want to listen to stories in other cultures and stuff, but you also don't want to pollute yourself by listening to, you know, like the equivalent of the, the hillbilly rednecks toting Confederate flags of their culture. You know what I mean? Like we know how to spot that in our own, you know, and and we can tell right. when we're making fun of the people with the Confederate flags or whatever. We're like supposed to be rooting for the people with the Confederate flags. We could tell the difference because that's like, where we live and where we came Our up, day-to-day. but like whenever yeah. we're talking about, yeah, but when we're talking about something that's so outside of our day to day, you're like you're trying yeah. not to pollute yourself by listening to something that's problematic, and therefore that's why it's important for people entire... to pick up better root. Yeah, because it seems like this is really well done, and conversations yeah. at the back sort of help support that. Yes, and that it's those conversations in the back that I think really, I mean, as a as a standalone comic, this is really great. But those conversations in the back, those articles in the back, really um, add a dimension to this that should not go unnoticed. Most back matter is fun, goofy stuff. I've noticed that in a lot of image comics, specifically, where they they do actual essays in the back to provide, and I think. That might just be sort of part of the whole creator centricness of it. Like the creators themselves seek to give you more information yes. on a topic. I wonder if that is the case. So that might just be a subset of, of how image is structured, but I really enjoy it. It's one of the reasons why I'm I'm an image lady for sure. Image is just a cool publisher. Yeah, we should just rename this podcast Image Groupies RS or something. <laughs> 
maybe that could be uh, a different kind of episode if we ever start a Patreon, like a reward episode. Oh, yeah. <laughs> image title you should read. Yes. Just free advertising for image or something. All right. Well, I think we've said a lot about Bitterroot. And at this point, it's up for listeners to just read and enjoy and experience it for themselves. So on this note, y'all have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning. Thank you for joining us today. And bye. bye. All right. Well, welcome back to Girls Talk Comics. Girls Talk Comics. Mm. Listen, you came it's up mess- with the title. <laughs> I-, I did. <laughs> I did. We're going to try that again. <laughs> when you're trying to. Yeah. <sighs> oh, well.